How do you define greatness? You might ask a number of people, and you'd probably get a number of different answers. Some people might define greatness in terms of wealth. The more money you have, the more you can use that money to influence decisions or to move people this way or that. I'm sure you've heard sayings such as, money talks. Or when you're trying to figure out why certain decisions are made in a company or in politics, someone might tell you, follow the money. So is the possession of wealth the definition of greatness? Others might define greatness in terms of charisma. The more charismatic a person is, the greater ability he or she has to gain a loyal following. The more vibrant his personality is, the more persuasive his words is, the more one can wield people to this cause or that. So does that mean that charisma is the definition of greatness? Others still might define greatness in terms of power. By nature of being the strongest one, or the smartest one, or the one with the most training in a certain area, one can create outcomes in certain situations that others are not able to accomplish. Sometimes power comes in the form of having the greatest numbers. Sometimes power comes in the form of having the greatest mind. In war, a general with a brilliant strategy might win a conflict even though he has much smaller numbers because he knows how to employ his forces in the best possible way. So is power then the definition of greatness? Many would tell you that greatness is defined by the possession of these kinds of things. But as we open God's word this morning, we discover God's definition of what it means to be great. And we discover God's definition of greatness by what we see and what we hear from God's own beloved chosen son, Jesus Christ. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, verse 37 this morning. Luke chapter 9, verse 37, if you haven't already. As we come to Luke 9, 37, Jesus and his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, are just returning from a very marvelous event that they have experienced on the mountain. These three disciples have just seen, they have just beheld, the face of Jesus being transformed into an otherworldly appearance, in the words of Matthew, shining like the sun. They have seen the appearance of Jesus' clothing changed from the common everyday garb of a Jewish commoner into robes of brilliant white and shining. Mark, Mark writes in his gospel, shining like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. They had been overshadowed by a cloud from which the voice of God proclaimed to them the divine identity of Jesus as God's chosen son. But as they now come down off the mountain with Jesus, they are met by a great multitude. And out of the multitude comes a loud voice of a man crying out to Jesus. And in verse 38, you see the man emotionally pouring out to Jesus a disturbing account about his only son being demon-possessed. Look with me here in verse 38 and see what the man says. See the, 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 the passion and the distress in his voice. He says, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. I mean, your heart just goes out to him, doesn't it? For most of you have been parents. Most of you have raised kids. You know how it feels when you hear your child coughing throughout the night or crying because of the pain of an ear infection. Imagine the agony that must grip this father's soul every time he has watched his only son seized by this invisible force thrown around like a rag doll in epileptic convulsions, hardly ever leaving him, 
And when it does leave, his poor son is left battered and bruised. And to make matters worse, he has tried to do something about it by taking his son to the disciples of Jesus for healing. He believed that the disciples of Jesus would be able to cast out this demon like their master could. And he clearly must have heard that they had the ability to do this. And we read about this not too long ago at the beginning of chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1, tells us that Jesus had given his 12 disciples, his 12 closest, he had more disciples, but he had given the 12 power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And at least with some element of faith, this father had brought his demon-possessed son to the nine disciples who had not gone with Jesus to the mountain so that they might heal his only son. But we see a problem when we come to verse 40, don't we? What does he say happened when he brought his son to Jesus' disciples? Were his disciples successful? Well, they weren't. He says, I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. The disciples of Jesus, to whom he had given power and authority over all demons, could not cast this demon out. So that leaves us with a very big question, doesn't it? Why not? Why couldn't they? If indeed, as scripture says, they had been given by Jesus power over all demons. I mean, all is all. That's all that all means. There's no exception to that. So why couldn't they? What's the reason they could not cast out this demon? And verse 41 reveals that reason to us, doesn't it? Jesus answers in verse 41 and says, O faithless and perverse generation. Now hold on just a moment. Who is Jesus talking to right now? Who is he referring to? I mean, is he talking about the disciples? Is he talking about the father of the demons that possessed boy? Is he talking about the great multitudes? I mean, these are pretty serious words that Jesus is saying. They're very severe these are the kind of words that you would be ashamed to be on the receiving end of. It seems that the words Jesus is using are being painted with a very broad brush. In fact, it seems that Jesus is using a kind of language that has been used of God's people before. I invite you to turn to Deuteronomy 32 with me. Deuteronomy 32 In Deuteronomy 32, we find what is known as the Song of Moses, one of the last things that we see before Moses dies and the children of God enter the promised land. He has this last song that he declares to the people. And in Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses, the first four verses of the song deal with the greatness and righteousness of God. But when you come to verse 5, the focus of the song is on Israel, the people of God. And the description of God's people in these verses is not very flattering, is it? Look with me with what Moses sings, or what he says in the form of song. Speaking of the children of Israel, he says, They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Again, these are some pretty harsh words, aren't they? But is this description of the children of Israel well founded? Is Moses going a little overboard in what he's saying here? He's not. You keep reading on in Deuteronomy 32, Moses does not sugarcoat things as he reminds Israel of their past rebelliousness and utter abandonment of their good and gracious God. 
Just look with me in verses 10 through 14 and see all that the Lord has done for Israel. It says, he found him, he found Israel in a desert land and in the wasteland, in a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him. And there was no foreign god with him. He made Israel, he made him ride in the heights of the earth, that he might eat the produce of the fields. He made him draw honey from the rock, and oil from the flinty rock, curds from the cattle, and milk of the flock, with fat of lambs, and the rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the choicest of wheat, and you drank wine, the blood of grapes. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. Wouldn't you expect Israel to respond with such utter devotion to the one who had provided for them all these blessings? But how did Israel respond to the goodness of the Lord to them? Well, verse 15 gives the significant problem. But Jeshurun, another name for Israel, grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations, they have provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you were unmindful, having forgotten the God who fathered you. So back here in Luke chapter 9, verse 41, when Jesus replies with the words, O faithless and perverse generation, he is bringing to mind the past unfaithfulness of God's people in previous generations. And he is bringing the same harsh language that you, was used back then to bear on his current generation. The generation of God's people that Moses had led from Egypt to the promised land should have responded differently than they had done. They should have trusted in God to fight for them as he had delivered them from their Egyptian taskmasters. But instead, they would not go into the promised land. They saw the inhabitants of the promised land as too great for them. They created and worshipped gods of their own creation. You remember the golden calf in the wilderness? And Moses, we haven't seen you for quite some time. Here, let's, let's make gods of our own. Because certainly the God of Moses isn't around right now. They refused to trust God to go before them and conquer their enemies. And Jesus sees parallels with that generation and the one he has been ministering to now for many months. They may have finally broken away from pursuing after other gods. I think the exile cured them of that. But they still were demonstrating the same root sins that their ancestors had been guilty of. They were unbelieving. And they perverted God's ways. But there's a particular group of people at this moment that Jesus intends to feel the weight of his condemning words. Because this certain group of individuals, more than any, had no excuses. This group of individuals have personally walked with Jesus. They have learned from Jesus. They have even been equipped by Jesus to do the kinds of works that he himself had been carrying out. Who are these individuals? They're his disciples. They are just as guilty of unbelief in this moment as the rest of their generation. They should have been able to wield the power and the authority of Jesus over this demon that possessed this father's only son. But clearly, according to the words of Jesus, they had not been exercised in the kind of faith that was necessary. What caused it? 
Well, maybe they had let personal pride get in the way. Maybe in the moment with Jesus gone up on the mountain, kind of like Moses had gone up on the mountain, they believed the subtle lie that they no longer needed to trust in the power of Jesus. Maybe they thought that they had the ability and the power in themselves. Certainly with the size of the crowd that was present, the temptation to try to impress everyone would no doubt have been a strong one. So instead of seeking to bring glory to God, perhaps the disciples sought to bring glory to themselves. I mean, haven't you and I been guilty of such pride in our lives? If we were honest with ourselves. Don't we ever come to certain situations and we in our pride dismiss God's revealed way of responding to that situation and said, we substitute our own? We wonder why we get depressed. We wonder why we lose hope. It's because we substitute our way for God's. Haven't you ever substituted anger when the situation called for patience? Haven't you ever substituted your own self-confident way of doing things in the place of God's own way of doing things? So maybe personal pride was what resulted in the disciples' failure to cast out this demon. Another possibility is that the disciples of Jesus had given way to fear. Maybe there was something about this particular case of demon possession that shook their confidence. Maybe the brutality of this demon, you can see how the father described it. It was a pretty brutal situation. Maybe the brutality of this demon was beyond anything that they had seen, and they had faltered out of fear as they tried to exercise the authority given to them by Jesus. Whatever it is, the text doesn't make clear, but whatever the issue may have been, one thing is clear, they did not exercise the same faith in the power and authority of Jesus as they had in the past. And as a result of their unbelief, they failed. But they shouldn't have. They didn't have to. Jesus is justified when he says, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? I've walked with you disciples all these months. I've shown you all these things. You even come to admit that I am the Christ of God, and yet you fail. You fail to believe. And it's not failure that's the problem. It's unbelief. Because even our failure, we know it's not final. God isn't keeping a tally of our failure, saying, okay, you know, one time, okay, we'll let that pass two times, we'll let that pass three times, seven times, all right, you're, you're, you're done. I'm done with you. God doesn't do that. Or do you think unbelief is a big deal to God? When he's given you everything to do what he has called you to do, you better believe it's a big deal. His disciples have been given everything they need to succeed in the ministry that Jesus has entrusted to them. They have his message. They have his power. They have his authority. They have his instructions. They know exactly what they are to do and how they are to do it. So there is no legitimate excuse for failing the way they did. But as we read on, reminded of the fact that Jesus never fails. Because what does he say? He says, bring your son here. At this moment that the demon possessed, uh, the demon possessing the boy chooses to act. In verse 42, it says, as he was so coming, the demon threw the boy down and convulsed him. And it's almost like this was nothing for Jesus. Because the words just come in such quick succession. Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Just like that. I am sure the failure of Jesus' disciples had been a disappointment. Perhaps even a discouragement to the crowds who were watching. I'm sure they had come to expect the kind of things the kinds of miracles that they had grown accustomed to with Jesus, and more recently, that they have seen from Jesus' own disciples. What questions may have been going through the people's minds when they saw the disciples fail? 
maybe they were thinking in their minds, has the incredible time of healing come to an end? Has God ceased visiting his people with such gracious acts? Who knows what we're going through the mind of the crowds? But when Jesus succeeds where his disciples failed, all the crowd's negative or discouraged thoughts flee away because they recognize that God is still at work. And his power is great. Verse 43 states, they were all amazed at the majesty of God. It's as if the disciples' failure, the failure of men, highlights the success and the power of God. That would be a great place to end this little story, wouldn't it? God wins. The end. And we know that's how the the, the, the grand story is going to end. Aren't you glad? That there will be a day coming where sin will no more have dominion over you fully. Even now we can live in victory over sin, but we know there's a day coming when sin will not even be possible for the Christian. It's a day when God will wipe all tears from our eyes. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more death. And that day is coming. We know God wins in the end. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. But that's not where the story ends, is it? God triumphs. But Jesus has words for his disciples right after this. Actually, Matthew and Mark's Gospels have Jesus and his disciples leaving at this point and heading through Galilee toward Capernaum, which you might call Jesus' base of operations. But in Luke's Gospel, the Holy Spirit wants us to see how closely connected the reaction of the crowds are in verse 43 with the words that Jesus tells the disciples next in verse 44. So verse 43 is worded in such a way that would leave room for Jesus and his disciples to be traveling when he tells what he does. But verse 43 also causes us to conclude that what Jesus says next, he says just moments after the healing of the demon-possessed boy. And this connection is important. I want you to see this connection between verse 43 and verse 44 because it helps us understand that the way everyone views Jesus now is not the way that they will view Jesus in the very near future. They might be, as we read in verse 43, they might be marveling at all the things that Jesus has been doing. That's not always going to be the case, is it? What does Jesus then tell his disciples? He says... Let these words, verse 44, let these words sink down into your ears. In other words, listen very carefully to the words I am about to tell you. What do they need to listen to? What's next? Jesus says, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Jesus wanted these words to sink down deep in the ears of his disciples. He wanted to give, he wanted them, he wanted them to give very careful attention to what he has just said. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed. He is about to be given over into the hands of men. So why does Jesus highlight these words so vivid? What is so important? Why does he draw such attention to what he is now saying, especially in connecting it to what the crowds are currently responding to him like? Right? They are marveling at the things that he has done, but he's saying that's not always going to be the case. Why is it so important that the disciples of Jesus fixate on what he has just said? First of all, he wants his disciples to understand that many of those 
who are now marveling at the works of Jesus now, who are even attributing the works of Jesus to God, like they ought to, are going to be the very ones into whose hands Jesus is about to be delivered. They may be marveling at Jesus now, but it will not be long before their attitude toward Jesus becomes something altogether different. They are going to do an about face on Jesus. And what is so fascinating is the way that Jesus' disciples actually receive these very important words that he shares with them. Verse 45, what does it say? It says, they did not understand the saying. And it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it. Now the words themselves aren't very difficult to understand, are they? I mean, you know what they're saying. I assume they knew who Jesus means when he says, Son of Man. He's used of himself many times in the past. I assume they understood the concept for a person to be handed over into the hands of another person or another people. But something about what Jesus said, they just could not understand because as important as it was, they were prevented from understanding the significance of what Jesus is saying. I don't know if it's because of the leftover shame of their recent exorcism failure. Maybe they were embarrassed not to uh, understand something that Jesus has just said they needed to let sink into their ears, but whatever the reason is, the verse concludes that they were afraid to ask him about the saying. But just because they did not understand then doesn't mean that they would never understand Jesus' words. There would be a time that everything that Jesus had taught and predicted and warned would fall into place in their thinking. They weren't able, at least at this time, to put the pieces together yet. And just because they didn't understand what Jesus meant doesn't mean that we can't understand the words of Jesus. Because we now have what Jesus' disciples didn't have then. What do we have that they did not? We have the whole story. It's all right here, isn't it? We know what happens with Jesus. And they would learn that in time. The Son of Man would be given over into the hands of men. Yet we have already seen how this same Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. We've seen how the same Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. We've seen a glimpse of of the Son of Man coming in his own glory, and the glory of his Father, and the glory of the holy angels. Isn't that what Peter and James and John saw on the mountain? But the Son of Man will also suffer, and be rejected, and be killed, and be raised. The Son of Man will soon be delivered over to the hands of men. He will be given into the control. They will mock him. They will beat him. They will drive a cruel crown of thorns into his head. And the Son of Man will will be delivered into the hands of men, will be lifted up on a cross to accomplish deliverance for those very men. So if people think that all the things that Jesus is doing is displaying the greatness of God now, his miracles, casting out demons, healing people, they haven't seen nothing yet. Because the greatness of God will be set on full display through the selfless humility of his Son on behalf of all mankind. Lord willing, we will be back next Sunday to finish looking into this window of God's definition of greatness. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, right now as his disciples are listening to his words, as they are trying to comprehend what he means when he says he is going to be rejected, he's going to suffer, he's going to be given over to the hands of men, he's going to be killed. 
But all these things, they are not registering as greatness. But Lord, this is the epitome of greatness. Because your son laid down his life to deliver mankind from all their sins. Father, help us to see in this act the incredible greatness of our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together and sing a hymn in closing. We have the Lord's Supper today. Hymn number four.